Let's pick up with the news now. Fox News alert. New reaction from President Trump to a bitter political battle which is refusing to go away even as the president gets set to attend a ceremonial swearing in for new Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. You are watching Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner. Happy Monday. Here today, host of Kennedy on the Fox Business Network, Kennedy. Fox News contributor, Lisa Booth. Fox News contributor Jessica Tarlov in the center seat. Steve Hilton, host of The Next Revolution. Maybe he'll have one here. <laughs> and author yes. of Positive Populism. He's outnumbered, so we say. I'm in on the revolution. We'll do That's it. That's right. <laughs> I don't Lisa know what was, we're doing, we, but we're going to do it. She was one of my revolutionaries last yes, night on yes, the show. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> I like that. That's yeah. great. And we've got some, some colors of the fall season. Very nice. Right? Some we lemon, do. some plum. Oh, well, I digress. We're moving on. <laughs> uh, some Democrats and liberal groups are not backing down from their opposition to Brett Kavanaugh, with some even floating the idea of a possible impeachment movement of the new justice. Ranking House Judiciary Committee Democrat Jerry Nadler vowing that if his party takes back power in the midterm elections, the plans to launch a new invest investigation are in the works. And how Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi is saying she wants more information on the FBI probe of Kavanaugh, including any communications between the White House Republicans and the FBI. President Trump spoke to reporters just a few minutes ago. We showed you this live. Let's bring it back now for this. I've been hearing that, that now they're thinking about impeaching a brilliant jurist, a man that did nothing wrong, a man that was caught up in a hoax that was set up by the Democrats, using the Democrats' lawyers, and now they want to impeach him. I've heard this from many people. I think it's an insult to the American public. Peter Ducey is live on Capitol Hill. Peter? Harris, Democratic leaders don't want their rank and file members to be discouraged by the Kavanaugh confirmation. So Nancy Pelosi just wrote them all a letter, all of her colleagues' letter, where she explains this. To preserve the full record of this dark chapter, I am filing a FOIA request so the public can see the FBI report, transcripts of interviews, instructions from the White House, and any communications to the FBI from Senate Republicans regarding the scope of the investigation. This is important to set the record straight. We must not agonize. We must organize. People must vote. And her Democratic colleagues on the Senate side are now saying they don't think Kavanaugh will ever shake the controversy from his confirmation. He's going to be on the Supreme Court with a huge taint and a big asterisk after his name. And uh, the partisanship that he showed uh, was astounding. And uh, the uh, uh, conspiracy theory that he accused us of behaving in was bizarre. And talk like that already has Republican leaders accusing Democrats of not acting in good faith. Democrats are running on resist, obstruct. They're not being shy about it. They want to bring more dysfunction. You're already talking about more hearings that they want to put in place if they get the House. But one thing Senate Democrats now seem to be pumping the brakes on, impeaching Kavanaugh. We are just less than a month away from an election. Uh, folks who feel very strongly um, one way or the other uh, about the issues in front of us um, should get out and vote and participate. Um, there's only ever been one justice that's been impeached, and I think talking about it at this point um, isn't necessarily healing us and moving us forward. And now the White House is doing their best to reset the public perception of the newest associate justice on the court. Justice Kavanaugh should not be seen as tainted. He should be seen as somebody who went through seven FBI investigations, including just in this last week. And if House Democrats get their way, that latest FBI investigation will be made public soon. They see it as a very important part of being a check on the executive branch and the judicial branch. Harris? Peter Ducey, thank you very much. Uh, as we bring it out to the outnumbered couch now, Steve Hilton, it's interesting. First, it's a movement to impeach the president of the mm -hmm. United States for Democrats. Not sure how that narrative went. But now there's a movement to impeach the new incoming Justice Kavanaugh. Yeah, the Democrats base, the activists who are really driving everything that the party does, they're driven by rage and hate and vengeance. It's just so primal. And that's why all talk of anything constructive or any kind of policy goal is all gone. It's all, we've got to get Trump, we've got to get everything to do with Trump. This Kavanaugh fight is not over because if, as, as it looks likely, they will um, take back the House, then 
it, they've been very clear that they're going to do these invest, reopen these investigations, and they've been specific about what they're going to do. It's going to be the sexual assault investigation reopened. The, he said that specifically. The guy who's going to be the incoming chairman. The sexual assault. We're going to have Christine Blasey Ford. It's going to be all over again. Plus perjury. They're saying that Kavanaugh perjured himself in his testimony. They're going to open that. Even if they don't go as far as impeachment, they've already absolutely concretely committed to the sexual assault investigation being reopened. So, but the justice is going to sit on the high court. He is going to be seated. He's being confirmed. So I guess the question becomes, can they keep him from doing his job? And I would think not. <laughs> I would no. think that if there are things that come up, the Supreme Court is going to look at them just like they always have. So, Jessica, my question for you is, how is this helpful? for the cause of the Democrats in the midterm elections. To, to promise not to solve health care, which you and I have talked yeah. about, that's the number one thing. Mm, totally. Like, I, I feel almost frustrated on your behalf. That's very kind of you. I'm taking all frustration donations at this moment after the weekend that we had. Um, Jerry Nadler has been out there in the front. He will be the chairman of the committee if the, if the Democrats take it back. Um, he's out there talking about it, but I would say to everyone, listen to Chris Coons as well, who was so on the forefront out there with Jeff Flake during uh, the Dr. Ford, Judge Kavanaugh, back and forth, who's saying, eh, I don't know about this. What the impeachment talk does is it fires up a, a very specific subsection of the base, the, the most angry resistors. How big but is that? Is that that's, it's, that's it's, a great it's, question. That is, that is a great question. Well, for I both think parties. in very. They're loud, but how big are they? Well, I think that they, they're. They are big. I don't think they're the biggest. It's kind of how I felt like the Bernie movement was overblown, that there was this narrative that that was our entire party. He had 45 when, million But it also And he won 22 supporters. states, so he yeah. wasn't yeah. completely overblown. But, that but it wasn't, but, but he yeah, still lost the yeah, exactly. He lost the primary by 4 million votes, which is problem, quite substantive. Well, because the problem, he was cornered out of a, a legitimate run well, by that, the DNC, which was dis actively dis running against him. We disagree Poor about that. Bernie. But, so it may, it may charge fine. up a part of the left wing base, but what it also does is turn off uh, independents. It turns off yeah. soft Republicans um, as well. And what President Trump has a knack for is pushing people into unmasking themselves. And I think what we've seen from the left is pure dis dysfunction, pure chaos, a party that is willing to do absolutely anything, even destroy an innocent man for political power. That's exactly what we I, saw, I, Jessica. I, I know and the problem here. is, I think it's going to... Let's hear directly from the president, and we'll come right back. Okay, that makes sense. Let's walk. <laughs> you don't hand matches to an arsonist, and you don't give power to an angry left-wing mob, and that's what they've become. So there's the president saying exactly how he sees the other political side. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, the, the confirmation sort of handed even more kerosene to the, the loudest on the fringe to throw into the campfire, which is already a conflagration. Uh, but you know, to Lisa's point, and this is where Democrats get it wrong, they're fighting President Trump as President Trump. And that's not why voters voted for him. They didn't vote for him because of the bombast. That's almost a, a, a secondary attribute. What they voted for was, you know, Supreme Court picks for a lot of people. A lot of people voted against Hillary, but it was also this unorthodox style of thinking and being able to tackle problems and affecting their lives <coughs> practically. If Democrats, instead of doing a, a bad impression of President Trump, which is only further tearing the country apart because they're not doing it right, if they come up with actual ideas and actual strategies and do a reset and say to themselves, where do we go from here instead of let's relitigate these losing issues, I, I, they'll have a, a much better right. shot. I want to go to you, Steve, because um, it, before you were ours <coughs> as our Fox family, you worked for David Cameron yeah. across the pond in England, and you saw some of what Kennedy is talking about right now. You know, that, that sort of misreading the, the electorate. Totally. Yeah, I think that the, 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 the resistance um, base may not be 100% of the party, Definitely but it's certainly 100% of the strategy right now. They have 100% control of the leadership. That's where they're going. And the loony left, as it were, are taking over. And there's a real danger for the party there, just as you were saying, Kennedy, because this can spiral out of control. And there may be a few voices for moderation within the Democratic Party, but they're not being heard. They're I, being I don't completely think that's, drowned out. I, I don't think that's true. When I look at who's actually 
technically in charge. So Chuck Schumer is in charge of the Senate. He certainly doesn't seem like yeah, but a loony leftist. Yeah, but he's behaving, behaving way, like a loony left what, crazy person. What, what, the well, way but wait, 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 wait. Support Kavanaugh even before. Right, no, but you, there are a number of Democrats who. But Jessica, you had you had. But it wasn't on that basis. He was not supporting it with him because of his policy ideas or how he thought it would be ruling. Dr. Ford. A lot of people any did of us that. had even known what she was actually. But, doing. That, but he ha opposed him even before Dr. Ford was on the scene, and Which that's where a lot moderate. of. Which is moderate. But you have well, the problem is. There, but you're but you're trying to say that this that this left wing resistance is not part of mainstream Democratic Party. But you have. I'm saying it's two not the potential, majority. You have two potential presidential hopefuls, Cory Booker and uh, Kamala Harris. On the Senate Judiciary Committee, yeah. willingly taking part of this disgusting chapter in American history of Lisa, literally I know weaponizing that you're baseless on a, you're allegations on a tear about the Brian against Kavanaugh an innocent, stuff and saying an innocent be, man whose life has been because destroyed. Because Americans care there about are, fairness and due get, process and justice. And <laughs> Democrats demonstrated they care about none of those things. Okay, but let's, Jessica, let, let, then let's talk about you know someone who's not on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Elizabeth Warren, mm -hmm. and here is someone who's happy it, it, to not only exacerbate the gender war but really blow. It up and you know potentially alienating a lot of male voters, saying you know she needs to go to Washington. That a woman She's has to be on top of the ticket. That a woman I, has to be on top, which is a wonderful thing. I hope my daughters see the point yeah. in their lifetimes, and, and certainly in, while they're still children, where there is a woman president, not because she's a woman, but because she's the best candidate with the most energy who can bring people together and offer a vision and offer freedom. Well, or but I don't think Booker that's the argument. argument. Yeah. Or Curry Booker calling daughters, on people to get up and face faces. Oh, yes. He's been inciting the mom. I'm literally being yelled at by everybody but Harris right now. So let me just. I, I said, but Harris. I wasn't yelling at yeah, you. I no, you were not the Elizabeth Warren's also I, a nut job when it comes right. to Elizabeth Warren, I. I actually don't think she was arguing that she should be voted for, or a woman should be voted for, just on the basis of their gender. I think if you look at people who are also taking a more prominent role, like an Amy Klobuchar, for instance, who I think handled herself brilliantly through the whole Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh situation, or you look at, I mean, she might be gone come November, but a Heidi Heitkamp, for instance, people whose names Americans didn't know until actually these Supreme Court hearings, where they didn't really know what Amy they Klobuchar stood for. Would, would love a, a shot in this Democratic yeah. field, but unfortunately, I don't, but she's not modern, arguing modern that that's true. voices like. Like that are drowned out. Yes, I, but I'm not the sure. Clowns, I'm, like Lindsey Bowen, Kamala Harris, and Elizabeth Warren. Because you have seen this before, and and on your show every Sunday night, um, and I'm giving you a shameless plug. No, no, more. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, you talk all the time about this idea of compartmentalization and people getting things based on the boxes that they check. And I just want to make sure that we kind of sit for a minute on how that hurts everybody's cause. That you've got to have the most qualified people for whatever the position is, and let let all of those box checking things come along with it. I mean, that's a fabulous thing to have women and people of color or whatever. But merit based is really where we need to be right now. Of course, that's right. And and actually, the the real uh, serious goal would be to eliminate any barriers to people. Uh, there you yeah. go. Moving up. That way, it's an and, equal. And to ascension. their progress, wherever they come from, whatever their background, whether it's gender or race, and every everyone on the right should support that. That's what opportunity is all about. But all of that is out the window because the the definition these days of the Democratic Party is the hate and anger. It's the women's march, who none of these people have disavowed, who literally put out a, the most disgusting tweet. Susan Collins, who has sponsored 28 bills on sexual violence, the women's march call her a rape apologist. The, uh, that the leader is what the, the women's march. I don't think there were millions of women who participated in that in this country second. and Kamala around Harris the world because has of not Linda Sarsour. That, has, or, she? has Cory Booker, has Kirsten Gillibrand. They all show up to these women's march events. They proudly go on about the women's march. They haven't I, disavowed or that. Or Maxine Waters who says that you should attack what you don't agree with. Or Cory with. Booker saying the same thing. Get up in the face of those you disagree. Exactly. How does that not represent the left-wing mob? They're the, the faces of it. Oh, it's going to be a spirited hour. Yeah, can I tell. can feel Glad it. Glad you're here, Steve. <laughs> 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 Jessica, you're tough, though. I appreciate you. Thank you After Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met with Kim Jong-un over the weekend. Boy, it was a busy weekend. Amen. <laughs> the Trump administration says North Korea is now ready to let inspectors into its missile sites. Will we see another Trump-Kim summit? Plus, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein is on Air Force One, people, right now with President Trump. They're going to Florida, their first meeting since those reports that Rosenstein discussed secretly recording the president and removing him from office. How much turbulence <laughs> is there on that flight? Stay I see close. what you did there. <laughs> We'll be talking on the plane. I actually have a good relationship other than 
There's been no collusion, folks, no collusion. This is a Fox News alert. President Trump right now flying to Orlando, Florida to give a speech at a police convention. And he has a special guest on Air Force One, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. Oh, this is going to get interesting. This comes after last month's New York Times report that Rosenstein had discussed secretly recording the president and possibly removing him from office under the 25th Amendment. Rosenstein denies that report. Here's the president this morning. We won't be talking on the plane. I actually have a good relationship other than there's been no collusion, folks, no collusion. No, I don't. I didn't know Rod before, but I've gotten to know him, and I get along very well with him. Rosenstein expected to meet with White House Republicans on Thursday. Here's House Intelligence Committee Chair Devin Nunes on his questions for the deputy AG. I think it all comes down to whether or not he was willing to wear a wire or not. If he was willing to wear a wire and secretly record the president, Maria, uh, it's uh, some place that this country's never been before. I, I don't know of any time in the history of this country where you had people who are at the top levels of government conspiring to secretly court a president so that you can trap the president into, doing so, into being able to go after the 25th Amendment to remove the president. This meeting also comes after former top FBI official James Baker told investigators last week that a DNC-linked lawyer was feeding information to the agency prior to its launch of an investigation into the 2016 Trump campaign. Here's what Congressman Nunes had to say about that. Well, now you have one of the top lawyers for the Democrats and the Clinton campaign who was feeding information directly to the top lawyer at the FBI during before even the FISA warrant. So so now you have absolute proof that that wasn't told to the FISA court. So you want your your evidence of FISA abuse? There it is right there. All right. So Nancy Pelosi says that she wants those 302s from the FBI investigation into Brett Kavanaugh. Devin Nunes wants all of this information regarding Fusion GPS and any sort of interface they had with Department of Justice or FBI officials. Are we going to get to see any of this? Uh, I don't know, but I'm, ju I'm just sort of reminded that with all the um, Kavanaugh uh, controversy over the last few weeks, that whole Russia conversation, it's all got to gone away. It's all these names from ancient history now. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Strzok and Lisa Pitt, you know, how long is it since we've talked about them? I don't know what Devin Nunes... I've enjoyed Nunes, the break. Uh, me too, frankly. <laughs> um, Devin Nunes, I don't know what he's talking about. Well, first of all, yeah, on your question, yes, we should get the information. Absolutely right. Um, because it's quite clear to me, and I think everyone watching this, that there are certainly grounds for suspicion mm -hmm. that the permanent bureaucracy, the Obama um, uh, holdovers, uh, both before the election and after, were, were up to no good. How bad, how serious, we don't know. We need the information. But there's clearly something to investigate there. Nunes's point on Rosenstein, I don't quite understand what he's talking about there. It's not just whether he actually went through the process of wearing a wire or not. The fact that he was even thinking about it, talking mm -hmm. about it, and discussing it shows he's totally disloyal and has no place being in the administration. However, it seems to me that President Trump, it's quite interesting what he's doing now, feels as if um, prior to this revelation and this report in the New York Times, Rosenstein was in quite a strong position mm -hmm. with respect to the president because he was basically there um, unfireable because it would have been such an outrage if he did that. Now, his position is much, much weaker because this has been revealed. And I, it seems to me that the president And look at is, the people who have been removed since that investigation Yes, and the president's launched. probably saying, you know what, actually, I've got this guy where I want him now because he's, he's much more vulnerable than he was before. And that's probably why, um, as it seems likely, he's not going to Well, find Steve brings up a good point, Harrison. That's context because when you are in a private text exchange with your paramour or with your friends, I, I think you have much more license to say pretty much whatever you want. And you can say, hey, this was a personal joke between two people. Uh, I don't have to describe any of this. But when you're in a work context and you're talking yeah. about things like removing the president via the 25th Amendment or secretly either wearing a wire or have someone else wearing a wire, that's not necessarily funny. I mean, you are in a work setting, and maybe the president is offloading some of that heavy lifting to Congress so they can ask those tough questions. Um, that's a possibility. I do think it's interesting, as Steve points out, that now the leverage is gone yeah. for Rosenstein. Yes. He's in a, in a position of capitulation, really, and now he's on Air Force One. Um, so you talk about what you would say in front of your boss and what you wouldn't say. 
We've heard all sorts of things. You brought up it's not funny because it's been suggested that perhaps it was a joke, and I don't know how you joke about right. getting because that's the same sort of narrative that we had between Strzok and Page. Get rid of the president before he's in the White, the White House. I mean, is it a question of bias? I, I'm certain that would come up at least with Congress. Does it come up on Air Force One? Well, what happens? He's obviously in a place where Rod Rosenstein can't just slam the door and, and walk out of an uncomfortable no. meeting. There'll he can't no take his badge out off and of take a parachute. You're going to need a parachute, yeah, exactly. a parachute <laughs> if he exits. I think it'll actually be far more cordial and friendly than what you would you think assume. The point based of on, it is, what, I what think, leverage does this kind of put well, back and forth? Well, I think the president has also enjoyed a few weeks break from the Russia investigation, and he already said, I think he, you know we have a good relationship. He's a good man. He needs to make it through the midterms. I think that his team has made that clear to him that you can't have any upheaval on the Mueller side of things. Uh, going into the midterms, especially since uh, the GOP has gotten a boost out of the Kavanaugh hearings. So if he goes and he fires someone like A.G. Sessions or Rod Rosenstein, when you look at public opinion polls on this, you will inflame a part of the country, the independents, for instance, that might have been on your side but about you that. But you don't have to invite him on Air Force One. That's that's. Well, that's I think it's like, to say I'm in charge, right? Yeah, he works for me. Right. He comes, that's on, a he reset, comes in my of fancy in car charge. in the sky, and, and, and yeah. we do things on my terms. But I think it will be very like, hey, you you know, you like Diet Coke, I like Diet Coke. You know, I'm or, fascinated say, by it. or chocolate cake, or maybe two scoops of ice cream, which are all delicious things uh, and that I agree with President Trump. Yeah. Uh, but look, I think he should wait till after the midterms and then fire him because I don't trust the guy. He lays out the case yes. for firing James Comey. Exactly. Uh, and then he appoints a special counsel to look into the firing of James Comey. So that right there makes no sense to me and is super sketchy. Another thing that's super sketchy is this information about James Baker, who was a top FBI attorney who was at the heart of the surveillance. And now we know that he met with a Democrat Party attorney. Uh, a meeting that before, he described as atypical. Atypical, exactly. Abnormal, atypical. Uh, weeks before they launched the um, surveillance into Carter Page and the investigation into the Trump campaign. And remember, yep. and remember also that we know that the dossier was used to obtain a FISA warrant, which is an opposition piece of research, still unverified. And even Christopher Steele has admitted in a London court that parts of it are false yes. and fictitious. Well, so, so I and mind you, we are ahead, still Steve. at a point where Carter Page has not been charged with anything, and not a single person on the Trump world has been tied to any sort of collusion. So we are here, and we're looking at all these sketchy things are coming so, together. I just very, very quick, but I just totally agree with you, Lisa, you. that <laughs> he has to be fired. You cannot have a situation where someone so senior is so clearly disloyal, plotting against the, the, the head you, of the so executive I, I branch. I think what the so president does go. here, so I think what the president does here is he, he keeps him until after the midterms. He's only got a month. And keeps him close. And then and he allows Congress to yeah. ask him those questions, uh, lay the case Absolutely. out, get some answers from him, uh, show blatant hypocrisy, and then he'll have grounds Real quickly, to fire. Kennedy, lesson learned from James Comey? <laughs> we have learned so many lessons from James Comey, and, and in terms of the left firing, the because even he Jessica has said that Hillary book. Clinton would have would have fired Comey right out the gate. They won. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that and I would wins. not have been mad about it at all. <laughs> no. I don't think anyone on this couch would right. be. So. <laughs> Speaking of hurricanes, tropical storm oh. Michael is now Hurricane <laughs> Michael, and it's strengthening as it closes in on the Florida Gulf Coast. When and where will it hit? How bad could it be? We are tracking the path of the storm in a live report next. Plus, less than a month ahead of the midterms, both Democrats and Republicans say the battle over Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh has fired up their bases. So which side is right? We'll debate that next. And it's a disgrace. And I think it's going to really show you something come November 6th. Fox News alert now on Hurricane Michael, growing rapidly and taking aim at the Florida Gulf Coast. Governor Rick Scott has declared a state of emergency, and the National Hurricane Center is saying Michael will continue to strengthen, expected to make landfall midweek. Adam Klotz is tracking the storm live from the Fox Weather Center. And Adam, hurricane season is not over yet, and this is a stern reminder. Yeah, it is, and we're still kind of at a time where it's typical to see hurricanes like this, at least the next couple of weeks, and now we have one that could be a big one. Here's what we're looking at, the center of circulation just off the coast of Cuba, uh, intensifying over the course of today from a tropical storm now up to a hurricane. As a result, we've got the hurricane advisories in place. Uh, this is a watch stretching from Pensacola all the way to the Florida Big Bend. Uh, 
any spot along here, this eventually could be making landfall. The timing for this, it runs over the warm Gulf water. So from a Category 1 up to a Category 2, a Category 3 storm currently projected to be off the coast of the Florida Panhandle by early Wednesday morning. At that point, a Category 3, which means winds up to 120 miles an hour. This could be a large storm by the time it makes uh, its way to the landfall of the United States. Still several tropical model runs, and there's a little bit of indecision of where exactly this could make landfall. Perhaps the eye wall making anywhere from Pensacola stretching over towards Apalachicola. Anywhere along here, though, you want to be paying very close attention to this system as it gets closer and closer. The wind field with this will cover a large area, put it into motion for you. And again, this kind of allows the timing there as you get into early Wednesday morning, some of these tropical force winds and the hurricane force winds making it their, uh, their way there. Uh, the good news with this one, if there is any good news, it seems to be moving quickly, Harris. This isn't going to be a Florence. This isn't going to stall and uh, create 40 inches of rain, but this is one we're going to be paying very close attention to Tuesday into Wednesday morning. Yeah, if it's coming to your neighborhood, you definitely want to yep. keep an eye on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Adam Klotz, thank you very much. The American public has seen this charade, has seen this dishonesty by the Democrats. It was all made up, it was fabricated, and it's a disgrace. And I think it's going to really show you something come November 6th. I think a lot of Democrats are going to be voting Republican on November 6th. The president in the last hour on how he sees the Kavanaugh confirmation battle playing out in the midterm elections. Democrats and Republicans have different predictions, of course. Many in the GOP say they believe the process has energized their voters. Uh, Democrats say the fight has motivated women who may already be dissatisfied with the president and Republicans. Yesterday, there was a stark contrast between two prominent women at the center of the Kavanaugh confirmation. Senators Maisie Hirano and Susan Collins. Democrat Hirano voted against confirming Kavanaugh. Republican Collins, as you know, voted for him. Here's how that conversation played out. I do not believe that Brett Kavanaugh was her assailant. So I do believe that she was assaulted. I don't know by whom, and I'm not certain when. She said that she thinks that, uh, she said that Dr. Ford thinks that she was assaulted, which is even more insulting than saying that uh, she gave a very credible account. I certainly believe Dr. Ford. Steve, you know, the back and forth on this left the facts on the side a long time ago. And the one thing that Susan Collins, and I put this in the fact box, said, we need to know who leaked the information. Don't Democrats want to know that? Because it seems like it might have come from their team, and that's important to know. Yeah, and all those crocodile tears about um, Dr. Blasey Ford and how this has had a terrible impact on her and her family. Why? Entirely because of the actions of someone on the Democratic side. It was only Democrats who had the letter, who had the information. Mm -hmm. And we can argue forever about who leaked it, but it, we know one thing for sure, it was a Democrat. The other thing I'd say is that, that, that Susan Collins' speech on uh, Friday when she was announcing how she was going to vote. On the Senate floor. Oh, my yeah. God. It was honestly one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. I found it not just impressive, but also very moving because she took her, her role so seriously. And, and, and for... Um, Senator Hirono just to sort of dismiss her as insulting Dr. Ford. I just think it's so ridiculous when that, that speech was a model of, of how a senator should behave on such an important question as confirming a justice that all the senators should follow. Can I, can I add something to that very quickly? Um, it, a, a friend of mine boiled this down as facts versus feelings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I thought when we heard on, on Friday when we were on the couch that uh, Senator Collins was going to give the speech, I assumed that she was going to be a no vote and she was going to make a rationalization for why that was to be. Instead, she made a very logical yeah. case for why she was, in fact, voting in the affirmative. She went through his record, she went through the allegations, she went through her reasoning process, and you're right, that's incredibly rare for a senator to do something like that, particularly one who's not up for re-election mm. right. in a month. And, you know, in, in doing that, it, it did something that we didn't expect, and she also saved her confirmation until her declaration until the very last sentence, so we were all sort of at the edge of our seats wondering exactly what she was going to do, because as we were on this couch uh, Friday at noon Eastern, 
we had no idea how the vote was going to go after watching that the, roll call. The one thing that we did know, and I know because we had Sarah Sanders on overtime, um, and, and that was that the White House was confident that they had the vote. So at that point, perhaps, because we know the president had been talking with the fence sitters, as we call yeah. them, uh, the White House may have known much more than we did. So let's hear from uh, Senator Susan Collins now on 60 Minutes. Watch this. I did not try to weigh a political calculus to this decision. It's too important for that. I just had to do what I think is right. So let's shift to the politics, shall we? Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell was talking about whether or not, you know, Joe Manchin voting with the Republicans is all that important. We'll hear from him in a moment, but I just want to get your thought on losing Democrats on this process. Well, just one. And Joe Manchin voted to confirm Neil Gorsuch. I know Heidi Heitkamp and Joe Donnelly ended up voting against uh, Judge Kavanaugh, but that doesn't surprise me. And that, that's who Joe Manchin is. And I would still rather have Joe Manchin than a Republican. Mm -hmm. So that, that whole argument, you know, with Democrats saying, oh, we're going to come for Joe Manchin, Joe Manchin represents his voters. Mm -hmm. And as for what's And you don't Collins think some of them are Democrats? No, I, I think a lot of them are Democrats, but overall, I mean, West Virginia voted for Trump by, what, 42 points or something insane like that. He was doing what he thought was right. I hope that Susan Collins is telling the truth when she says there was no political Whoa. calculus. I don't, I don't no, think no, no, that. I, no, wow. no it's, not a, it's not a wow movement. I think that when Susan Collins says she doesn't believe Dr. Ford was attacked by Judge Kavanaugh, she reinforces the narrative about women, that they don't remember things, that they are hysterical, well, she didn't. that and they there is make no up things, that and this Lisa happened, Murkowski, not I think the, the fact that she didn't think, remember things, I, I don't think that speaks did, to her gender. Very, I think that speaks no, to the fact that there are gaps in her memory. About well, you women. Also, she was very clear. Dr. Ford said she was 100% certain it was Judge Kavanaugh. But she and Lisa cannot Murkowski remember anything else in every witness. Let's not relitigate the hearings well. here. But what no, Kennedy but said is really important <laughs> because the memory part is really that that's not about gender. And, and I understood but there Senator is Collins on the Senate floor, Lisa, to have been saying last Friday that here are the things that she looked at long before Dr. Ford even came along. And all of the hours and the pages that she had read, the hours that she spent with the judge, I mean, it would take what she said a lot to switch it, to turn it around. Same for Senator Jeff Flake. I, I want to hear now, though, from Mitch McConnell, and then we'll come back. Okay. Well, Joe Madge is still a Democrat. And we're trying to hold the majority. We appreciate his vote for Judge Kavanaugh. I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, but we're trying to win seats. So, Lisa, is this the complicated thing for Democrats now? So they, they lose one, potentially many, whomever Manchin might have heard from uh, among his electorate. But, but the bigger issue is this is still a fight for the midterm elections, and now Republicans, at least statistically, seem to be in a better position. Well, they are. And I would also say that Susan Collins stood up for the rule of law, fairness, due process, and things that Americans fundamentally believe in. And I think why so many Republicans were so outraged by this entire process and watching the left basically take away the right, the presumption of innocence from Brett Kavanaugh. I think that's why you have Republicans so fired up. And I think it's actually bigger than even a, a policy item like Obamacare, because I think um, Republicans felt this on a visceral, deep level. And I think that's why you have so many Republicans motivated. And it will hurt Democrats, because looking at states oh. like Montana with John Tester, who was a no, his first television ad that he ran was touting his work with President Trump. He took out a full page yeah. newspaper ad before President Trump did a Heidi rally Heidi in Montana. The, the same it's going to be really hard for him to try to do that now. Yeah, but I mean, Heidi Heitkamp's probably done. That? Yeah. Like, this is one of the president's biggest promises on the campaign trail. Do they think that those people are genuinely supporters of the president, regardless of how some of them have voted? Well, I mean, and, got, and on, I think on social media, it. people were saying that Susan Collins hates women. She has yeah. abandoned all women. I mean, that, that kind of rhetoric is nonsense. Uh, of course it is, but it, it is also important to consider the case Lisa Murkowski made to vote against Kavanaugh, which had nothing to do with Dr. Ford's allegations, actually. It had to do with his temperament and who he showed himself to be during these hearings. Okay, And I ahead. hope she gets primaried. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Steve, you just let she it She want to write in already. She's uh, going to be The State Department fine. says North Korea is ready to let inspectors into its missile sites. Does this up another Trump, does this set up, rather, another Trump-Kim summit? Stay with us. Breaking news with the play-by-play -play now is the president uh, has landed on Air Force One in Orlando, and they have just pulled up the stairs. So we are waiting with anticipation to see President Trump 
come off of Air Force One. And it is interesting because, of course, on board, as we've been telling you today, is the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. And their relationship has been stretched and strained in recent weeks. In fact, there was talk that maybe Rosenstein would lose his job over reported comments that he made about the president. Uh, he denies them, but it's been reported that Rosenstein has said that the president should go and, and was thinking about a way to enact the 25th Amendment to make that happen, including wearing a wire. So what has that conversation been like? I can tell you that with the White House press team, Hogan Gidley on board, saying that the president and Rosenstein spoke for more than 30 minutes, and I've got some Cool notes from the camera crew that's on board in there. So we don't have specific video yet. We may get more. Uh, don't know exactly who was in the room with them. Hogan Gidley says he'll tell the media as he can. But uh, ask if this means that Rosenstein still has a job. We were told yes. He does. Mm. Hogan Gidley said he would work on getting pool more information about that conversation, like I said, <laughs> including who was there. But at least as they get off the plane right now, the president and Rod Rosenstein, Rosenstein still has a job. Kennedy, you and I were talking earlier about the timing of this. And it, it is a strong optic to see the president with you yes. in any accord, and you're keeping your job after all that's gone between these two in the last few mm -hmm. weeks. Um, but the midterms are in, in the view, and they're in the close view. And uh, this is the latest dramatic amuse-bouche that is being served up <laughs> at Shea Trump. Uh, this is also signaling that we are getting past the, the Kavanaugh chapter. Yep. Uh, the Associate Justice has, in fact, been confirmed and sworn in. And now the president is uh, moving on to make peace with Rod Rosenstein so Congress can... Um, Go after his remains. <laughs> Remember that the, you know that Rod Rosenstein. He's effectively the client for the for the whole Mueller investigation, um, and so that is going to loom large the minute the midterms are out of the way. We can be back to all of that and asking when is the report going to be published? What's it going to mean for for the president? What do you think it means so politically if the the president is exonerated in the Mueller report? Wow, I just think that. Well, first of all, I think he will be of, this, of, this, of the charge of collusion. And I think it will just provoke even more rage mm. on the left, where one after another, these arguments they've made to try and bring down President Trump have just sort of disappeared. They'll just have to think of something else. I think that's the main thing. They can think, oh, my God, what are we going to go after now? So I want to bring everybody's attention back to the screen here. This is Orlando, Florida. We know the president uh, on board with his deputy AG, Rod Rosenstein. We're talking about the, poli the politics in recent weeks between these two men. But it's, it's even greater than that, as Steve has pointed out. This has to do with what the other side will make as a calculation, Democrats. Uh, the president said today before he boarded Marine One, uh, there was no collusion. So he brought it That's up right. himself. Jessica? Yeah, well, he has. That has come up in, he said the, yes. in the rallies. <laughs> yeah, I got my mic. Uh, he does talk about it in rallies when he's kind of freestyling about the witch hunt thing, and now he's gone in an expanded witch hunt to the Brett Kavanaugh yes, and the situation well. and the yeah, hoax, the hoax using the same language. Yeah. I think his, his base is very receptive to those kind of trigger words. That brings you back to chance of lock her up and all of that. Um, but like I said, when we first discussed this in the president, it's popping out now. All right, the president of the United States out first here on Air Force One. This is Orlando, Florida, uh, and we expect to see also, and this will be quite the visual if we indeed see it, the deputy AG, uh, Rod Rosenstein, to be a fly on the wall during those 30 minutes that we're told that the two men talked. Uh, but we are getting a little bit of color in play-by-play. -play. The president getting right away in the motorcade. Sometimes he'll call an audible and he'll go talk with people who are gathered there uh, if there are crowds there. But let's look at the stairs. Uh, Kennedy, can you imagine uh, collusion? There was no collusion, was what the president said, getting on board Marine One, and then 30 minutes conversation He's with uh, these two men. You see the president there next to Governor Rick Scott. Is he smiling? Do we know? <laughs> no, Rosenstein uh, appears to have very positive body language. He uh, appears to be he was there with smiling. He has certainly, Kelly, he? He, he has certainly uh, dodged this round and has emerged with a rose. Harris? Uh, Hogan Gidley from the White House press team has told us that when asked the question, does Rod Rosenstein still have a job? The answer is yes. And again, like I said, sometimes the president will call an audible. So he was going to get into the motorcade 
And, uh, and now he is out with the governor of Florida, Rick Scott, now meeting with people. You see uh, the attorney general for the state, Pam Bondi, over the president's left shoulder there. And a big supporter of the president. So Absolutely. He reciprocated. Uh, and, and so we are watching, and hopefully we'll learn soon what the conversation was like with the deputy AG, Bride Rosenstein. But for right now, the president uh, greeting people on the tarmac as he always does. Yep. Sometimes you'll hear some audio, so we'll ask our team to kind of ride the audio and tell us if we can hear the president. I also uh, appreciate the fact, I believe President Trump is going to speak to Florida police chiefs, and we've yep. seen recent ambush of police officers. I think a lot of police officers felt in this country that you know, the Obama administration turned their backs on them. And President Trump made law enforcement, law and order, a big campaign issue during the 2016 presidential election. And I think he's kept his promise to law enforcement. And so I'm sure. glad that he's there today, letting them know that they have the support of the Trump administration and Americans. And remember, this is a really um, midterms loom over everything. And this is an incredibly important race, this Florida Senate race. You have Rick Scott there, who's mounting a really serious challenge to Bill Nelson and I think that I've always said from the beginning that this one could be the one. What swings it? Well I think that ah. the um, what happened it's very it's very close. Um, Rick Scott was just ahead. I think Bill Nelson has got a bit he's of a up, bump. Yeah from he's the, up a couple points. We were points. discussing this yep. Jessica from the uh, surprise um, winner of the governor primary on the, and on the what Democratic kind of great side. Campaign I, Andrew I want to jump in with this because our team is listening so closely in our control room and of course they can hear better. Uh, than we can. The president was just asked how his conversation went with the AG Rosenstein, and he said, <coughs> great. Uh, you're on the ground here, as Lisa has pointed out, with your police chiefs, and you've got your deputy attorney general uh, with you. You've got the attorney general of Florida, and you've got someone who's facing a tough battle, as we're pointing out, as Governor Rick Scott. This is more than your typical sort of let's set down and have a rally. There are a lot of pieces to this, Steve. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that the, 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 the political um, ramifications of this, of, of the Rosenstein thing won't last that long because it feels to me as if, in, in terms of the midterms, I don't think that that's going to be a big factor. I think we'll be off that conversation pretty soon. And it also allows the, the president but, to show off a little bit of uh, political diplomacy with Rosenstein yeah. because Democrats would love nothing more than for Rosenstein to be unfairly fired so they could have another campaign wedge issue. Uh, but here the, the president is reaching out to him. He has extended the storyline a, a couple of weeks here with all of the... Uh, the but I suspect one of the going. main topics of the conversation will be will be timing of a different kind. In other words, if you can imagine the president saying, what the hell is going on mm -hmm. with this probe that you are supervising? When are we going to get something? What's the plan? And, and that, I think, is, is so central to the political fortunes of his administration those, beyond the midterm. What are the satisfactory answers that the president could receive if he asked Rod Rosenstein, first of all, what on earth did you say in that meeting talking about the 25th Amendment? And what on earth is, is going on with this investigation? Well, I imagine Rod Rosenstein will say what he did when he pushed back against the New York Times, which was, I categorically deny I said anything about the 25th Amendment. And I was being sarcastic when I joked about wearing a wire. Now, take it or leave it, is it appropriate for someone in his position to even make a joke like that? That's something for discussion. And I think that you were right to raise the difference between what you're texting your paramour or your friend or when you're sitting in Andy McCabe's office. Now, we know from what's gone on with Andy McCabe that that maybe wasn't the most professional environment out there. Wow. But I imagine that, you know, he probably said to the president, I didn't, you know, I didn't say 25th Amendment. I was joking there. Um, I take my job. Well, I very, said it and I was joking. The two can't be the same. What, See, what is, and I take my job very seriously. I will not be rushing Bob Mueller, but, you know, Take it from me. I've worked here a long time. I'm, I'm taking it as seriously as possible. Uh, and we, we are going to have to scoot to a break, and the president is the backdrop right now, and let's bring him back into the foreground as he gets into the motorcade. Uh, he descended the stairs with a wave there. We saw him today. You hear the crowds cheering. He's along with Governor Rick Scott, Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi, as I mentioned, General uh, Kelly, his chief of staff, and, of course, Rod Rosenstein. Uh, at the center of the politics that we're talking about. But Steve Hilton has pointed out 
and, and probably correctly, that if the president isn't going to make a move on him and sort of take away his job in short with, that this will get off of this conversation pretty quickly. He's going to talk with police chiefs uh, in Florida today. We'll cover the news as it happens with the president of the United States just touched down in Orlando. Stay close. Thanks so much to the intelligent and very classy Steve Hilton. I, I Thank hope you, you so much. The day shepherding us through exactly. another huge news day, and uh, you know, he great job it. being right here on the couch after your big show last night. It's always a pleasure. Well Good done, to see you. televising the revolution. Exactly. All right. Well, <laughs> oh, what a glorious day we have started for you this afternoon. We're back tomorrow at noon Eastern, nine in the West. Now, here's Harris Faulkner.